This video is part of a monthly Asterix Patreon series, where a patron suggests a work, and I make a short video on what I thought the most interesting thing about it is. If you have something you want to suggest, consider supporting me over there. It's interesting that society in Mahotsukai Tai views magic as nothing more than a shallow novelty. At first it seems a little odd that it's so dismissive, that they think of magic as nothing more than some sleight of hand party tricks. Because the world is shown to be very quick to accept the strange, and even to make it mundane. The premise is set a year after The Bell appears, a giant alien spacecraft impervious to all of humanity's coordinated attacks. And because it remains passive and only observes until provoked, everyone has just already accepted it as part of the everyday, the new normal, if you will. And the ending spoilers, shows that the town doesn't even bat an eyelash at the giant sakura tree now constantly raining down on them. As everyone still commutes to work and school like normal, family members shouting, be careful not to trip on the petals, with the same nonchalance as a Hokkaido mother warning their children about the snowfall. Yet the fact that magic is not only real, incredibly deep, but that five teenagers are able to use incredibly powerful reality-altering spells is a hot-kept secret. All of the members of the club are looked down upon as immature weirdos. Even Saya's sister makes fun of her for it, semi-affectionately, but she states that she needs to grow out of her childish interests and move forward whatever that means. So the reason for this secrecy might simply be social stigma. In a world full of strange and wonderful, fantastic things, no one simply ever bothered to pay attention to a bunch of stupid little trinkets meant for kids. And in this way, what the fuck was that? I think you can draw a pretty easy parallel to the experience of being an otaku. There is very much a deliberate irony in portraying their rival club as the manga club a group led by the most beautiful, powerful, popular, rich girl in the entire school. With dozens of adoring fans, the teacher are literally shilling them out to the rest of the world. In most other works, the reverse is true, where the protagonists are the plucky anime club down on their luck that have to fight against the Riaiju student council. Especially in the 90s, with the moral panic over otaku brought upon by Miyazaki Tsutomu still very fresh. In the eyes of the school, manga is probably as frivolous a topic as magic, yet they are consistently given much more favor over the magic users club. Probably because the leader has these big old bazoombas like, whoa, she got back problems later in life. It reminds me of the scorn and derision that the proto-moe bishoujo artists of the 70s and 80s got. Being told that they should be focusing on more rugged, realistic, and importantly, socially acceptable gekiga. The club president in question, Miyama, constantly bullies the magic users club president, Takeo, over magic. But very common to bullying, magic isn't the root cause of the bullying, simply the latest ammunition she has. When roped into performing simple classic tricks at her party, she and the other guests of the manga club seem reasonably impressed and entertained, like a casual viewer enjoying an accessible action show or a feel-good movie but they enjoy it simply from the sheer novelty of it. It does kind of hint that the average person could get into it, but only if they gave it a proper chance or experienced it under the right circumstances. If you flipped the story and made the Magic Users Club into an actual manga club, then the character's personal motivations and arcs would still make perfect sense. Sayet had a huge, profound, emotional experience with it in her childhood that inspired her to chase it through her life. She has huge potential, but struggles with self-doubt, clumsiness, and societal expectations. Akane is naturally gifted, but largely absent and disinterested, skirting her duties so she can goof off and go on dates. It seems like she joined the club solely because she had to join a club, and she picked the one that would let her bludge the most. Both Nakana and Aburatsubo mainly joined solely to be close to their friends and crushes. And Takeo, the most devout magician in the group, found magic as his shelter from abuse and ridicule. He reminds me of a doujin creator starting their own circle. I mean, the motherfucker literally reverse-engineered magic from a book they found in a bloody cave. That's fucking base. Like a young fan so enraptured with this niche medium that they study and copy from their favorite artists. Both the design and the character of Takeo was based off of the director Sato Junichi, 
with character designer Ito Ikuko stating that Sato san ni hanashi o kiitta jiten de a kore wa Sato Junichi no monogatari nao da to katte ni kaishaku shita っていうのが now, of course, fans in their relationships to otaku media come in all shapes and sizes. And not everyone escaped to manga from abuse or faced ridicules from their toxic peers. Like, certainly not me. I'm also not suggesting that this is 100% definite proof that the staff involved in Sato himself definitely had these experiences. And the magic could be read as any hobby or any interest that is even slightly on the fringe of society. However, considering the medium itself that is conveying the story, and the body of work of the staff involved, I think it's not that much of a stretch to imagine that some of those social pressures and experiences with those social pressures seeping into the story itself. Also, Magic Users Club is about having a hobby is a terrible title. Come on man, cut me some slack. I do at least try with SEO. I know the numbers don't say otherwise. Please help me. What am I doing wrong? Sato often talks about realism in his works. For him, everything has to reflect reality. Even though the vast majority of his works either feature magic or set place in a very fantastical world. This is easily seen in things like the opening scene having no sound because it's set in space, the robustness of the animation in regard to motion and counter motion, and going to a school playground and sitting on the jungle gym to get a feel for how much your balls would get squashed when riding a broom. I'm serious, he did that. But it also shows up on a more fundamental level, as he talks about drawing upon childhood memories and the importance of showing differing, realistic family structures in shows like Ojamacho Doremi. If you have a group of anime creators, who are also anime lovers, making a show about a group of kids in a subculture that's widely known yet misunderstood as just a pursuit for kids, it's not hard to see where the rest of that realism went. 